Hi, here we are with the sixth episode in this little series of videos. Um, in this one, I want to pick up on the themes from the fourth video about the essential issues that form the basic principles of procurement. Now, if you remember, we had um, a short list of six things and here they're put into a table. So the first one I've, in this table, um, I've changed the sequence from the end of um, the slide on the fourth presentation. <clears throat> the first one is the source of funding. And um, what I've done here is I've said, um, if the answer to that question is PFI, which is where we pulled that one from, then the question is, where does the money come from? Um, and now it's interesting to focus on that question of where does the money come from? Because PFI is not the only answer. As well as PFI, we have PPP, which is a public-private partnership. We have owner-financed projects, public sector financed, developer financed, and so forth. Um, there's several different options. I've just listed five here for the sake of um, making the point. And I mentioned partnering as being something that was specific in construction. And if partnering is the answer, then the question is, what selection method will we use? And partnering is not the only answer. We could use negotiation or frameworks, selective competition and so on. And when we were discussing design, build, construction, design, build, procurement, if design, build is the answer, the question is, where does the responsibility for design lie? And there's a range of five choices offered here. You'll note that each box has three dots at the end, indicating that there are actually more than these. Um, and these are not scientific terms, of course. These are just um, things that occur in practice and the kind of vocabulary that people use. When we talked about um, the construction manager coordinating the construction without being liable for the um, execution of the works, um, if construction management is the answer, the question is, how do we deal with the responsibility for coordinating the work on site? And again, there's actually at least five choices in that issue. And if performance-based contracting was the answer, then the question is, how do we calculate the price? Is it based upon work and materials defined in a bill of quantity? Would it be cost reimbursement? Would it be a whole building and so forth? Um, there's a range of five choices there. And if the answer is integrated project delivery or um, um, int integrated project insurance, then the question is, how are we integrating the supply chain? And there's a list of five options there. So the interesting thing about this table is that it gives us quite a large number of permutations. Given that we, can, we need to answer each of these six questions, shown as principles here, um, and we have set out in this table five options for each of those six, then the number of permutations is five multiplied by five again and again and again, five to the power of six, which I think is 15,625 permutations. Now that's an interesting thing, right? 15,500 different ways of procuring a project shown on this one slide. And any book you pick up that explains how construction procurement methods work will list six, seven, maybe eight different ways of procuring a project as if each answer, answers like construction management, design build, PFI and so forth, as if each of those answers was a complete answer. So the point of this graphic is to show that when we identify a procurement method by the contracting method or selection method or pricing method, we're only providing part of the answer. If I was to tell you that my next building project is a design build project, that only tells you something about responsibility for design and responsibility for coordination. It tells you nothing about the basis for calculating the price, where I'm getting the money from, how I was chosen, what we're doing with the supply chain integration. The answer, if the answer is a contracting method, it's an incomplete answer. So the thing about this graph is that it shows that you have to explain six things. Another point about this 
is that all the information that we've been going through that explain the different procurement and contracting methods is really quite complicated and requires a fairly sophisticated understanding of all of the different roles that are involved in the process of construction. It's very difficult to come to terms with procurement if you're doing it from the point of view of how the different roles in the project relate to each other. That requires a huge amount of understanding. If you shift your mindset to the mindset of the client, the buyer, the, the person for whom the project is being commissioned, and you look at it from their point of view, they've got some very simple questions that are easy to understand, like where's the money coming from? How are we going to choose the people that are going to work on the project? Who's going to be responsible for design? Who's going to coordinate the work and take responsibility for that? How will we calculate the price? And to what extent should we worry about the integration of all of the myriad contracts in the supply chain? Those are much more simple and straightforward questions. And so my suggestion is that when we're looking at procurement methods and trying to make a decision about how to procure a project, is that we really need to begin with the client's requirements for the project. This is the approach that's been adopted in British Standard 8534 2011. Um, and we're currently working on folding this into the ISO 10845 as well. Um, but it also leads to an interesting decision making process. Um, because what I'm suggesting is that if you start from the point of view of the client, then this graphic provides us a very simple route through a really complicated decision-making process. So the start point is to ask the first question, which is, where is the funding coming from? So on this graphic, you see the left-hand side of the graphic is, is marked out as decisions relating to organising the project. And so the first thing about organising the project is to ask ourselves the question as a client, where's the funding going to come from? Do we want the market, the supply side, to fund the development and then we engage with it? Or do we want to fund it as the client by ourselves? So if we take the question, if we take the answer, the market, we want the market to fund it. We don't want to pay for it up front. Now then, the question is, OK, by the end of the process, do you want ownership to transfer to the client or do you want the ownership of the finished project to remain with the market? So if we say we want ownership to remain in the, on the market side of the transaction, then we're talking about um, the performance based contract kind of a lease. Um, in other words, for example, if you were to go and rent a hotel room, you don't want to take ownership. You don't want to end up owning part of the hotel. You just want to pay for it when you're using it. If you take a five year or 10 year lease on an office block, you don't, that's, you, the reason you take a lease is because you're not going to own it. And so the lease gives you a, a value based price just for the duration of the lease. If on the other hand, your engagement with this process is intended to leave you with ownership of the project, then you would be entering into a DBFO or PFI kind of a project. So in that scenario, you would be paying a unit performance price. What that means is if the government's procuring a prison, they would, and they were doing it through PFI or DBFO, they would pay per performance of a unit in something like um, an amount of money per occupied prison cell per month or if it was a highway, an amount of money for each vehicle that travels along the highway. So unit performance. And therefore, the client isn't worried about how it's built or, or, or how it's made or how it's designed, only about how it performs. And they only pay for it when it performs. And after a certain period of time, they stop paying a rent because ownership transfers to them. This is often periods like 25 or 30 years and things like that. So you can procure construction without having to actually pay for the construction, but only pay for the service that you receive. If, on the other hand, the client wants to fund the process from their own money, um, then they have to ask, well, are we going to go to the market for the design of this? If the answer is yes, then we'd be falling into a design build project. 
If the answer is no, we want to take control of the design process as a client, then we have to ask, what about the coordination? If we want the market to take care of the coordination, the supply side, then we'll be going into general contracting. If we want to coordinate it with our own person, then we'd be going into construction management. So we can see here that how the contracting methods emerge from the decisions of the, uh, the way that the whole process is going to be organized around the priorities of the client. And the selection methods are chosen at the point that we go to the market and that carries implications for the kind of supply integration, supply chain integration that we're going to end up with. So this client procurement decision flowchart, again, is part of BS8534, which I strongly recommend that you look at. Um, and it renders the whole process of deciding upon the procurement method um, a lot more straightforward. OK, so that's the end of considering these particular issues. Um, I'll leave it there for now and I'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.